discussed this meeting, she said, don't, uh, why don't you speak about professionalism and privacy? And I said, what? I said, that's easy, you do, it, you do this very often, and it's true because uh, as people grow older, they tend to get away from uh, technical stuff uh, uh, and so on, and they start to think about the uncertainties. So uh, moving from uh, towards professionalism is, is a logical thing. So I run courses on professionalism for residents at our department. First of all, uh, is uh, we have to be clear about what is a medical professional. And this is uh, from the source, source of word wisdom. Uh, this is Wikipedia, of course. That someone who has competences in and knowledge of medicine, who commits to putting these to work primarily for the benefit of patients and communities in keeping with the moral norms of the medical profession. It's a good as, uh, a definition as any. Uh, sociologists have been struggling for, with that for decades and they're still unhappy about it and they still have conferences about it. So, but the key, the key things are two. First, you have to, a medical profession, professionalist is somebody that works for the benefit of the people and he or she is competent. And this is why we have a spe special position in the society. And this, this is why it is so important. It's a constant struggle. You will never be absolutely perfect, but you have to try to achieve this goal. Um, so it is why it is important, because attitudes toward profession uh, determine uh, our actions in practice. Uh, the way we work is determined not only but about what, what do we know and what skills we have, but about our attitudes towards our, our profession. And, and if these attitudes are wrong, then you're going to be a bad doctor. And this is why we need to teach this at all levels of medical education. Uh, that's a good thing. The bad thing is that this is notoriously difficult. This is one of the most difficult things to do. It's very easy to teach, uh, to teach uh, uh, knowledge because you get, you get the students to learn some facts and then you put them to a test and if they pass over 55 or 60 or whatever percentage you, you, you decide or if they cheat well enough, they will, be, they will pass and they will be okay. If, how are you going to assess professionalism? How are you going to teach them uh, to be real professionals? It's quite another issue. So, professionalism is a, is a, general, it's a general concept. It applies to all, uh, to many professions. Medicine is one of, the, is the classical one. So, studying, medic, uh, studying professionalism has, a lot of studies has been done on, on medicine. Uh, and within medicine, family medicine has its own specificities, so, which reflects in, uh, uh, in, in, the attitudes toward professionalism. Within uh, uh, family medicine, prevention is becoming increasingly important. It's becoming a key, uh, a core element of, uh, of our work. So this is where we are. This is how we combine all these concepts in one, one thing. So this is theory, and we are practical doctors, so I don't want to spend too much time on theory because it tends to get boring. Uh, what I, when I started to working as, as a doctor, I had no problems. Everything was easy, everything was clear. I, I had answers to all the questions. Because I was a good student, I, I learned all the facts. And over the years, I, I, started, I started thinking. Now, this is a dangerous endeavor because if you start thinking, then you get into the areas of gray and things are not entirely white, bl black and white. So what I did for the purpose of this uh, conference, I gathered some examples that I got uh, in my, with discussions with, my, with our trainees. And um, some of them are easy, some of them are less easy. And together with these examples, uh, I have put down the comments that our trainees have put to me, uh, to which I had sometimes problems answering. So 
um, this is where we are. And these are cases where, which would be, I think, familiar to you. And uh, I will not give you any answers. I'm, tr I, I, I'm afraid that I wonder whether I, whether I will contribute to the knowledge. I will probably contribute to the confusion, but that's a lot of, this is what I like doing, so I'm sorry. So, first of all, a doctor refuses to be vaccinated in, against influenza. He, he works in the home of the, for the elderly. So, is this something that uh, is a professional uh, performance or not? So the, the question is, is transfer, transfer of disease to other patients in his care a real problem? It is. So I think that's an easy one. Agree? OK. Let's go on. I ha we have nine more. So. so this lady refused to treat a young girl whose parents did not want to vaccinate her against in infectious diseases due to their religious beliefs. She said, I'm not going to, to treat this child because I'm not going to be um, uh, what, I'm preach what I'm dealing with is uh, evidence-based medicine and so on, and they are in another world, so I'm not competent to deal with them. Let somebody else uh, uh, treat this girl. And the question was, how much are we allowed to discriminate our patients? We're always discriminating our patients. We like the ones that, are, that obey, that, are, uh, uh, that take drugs regularly and so on. Uh, and they get usually a better treatment. Sometimes these things go a bit to an extreme. No, this doctor would, uh, does not advise his patients to, to be vaccinated against herpes zoster at all. He knows that there are some guidelines that, uh, that say that people should be, in certain occasions, be vaccinated against guidelines, but he says, I'm not, this is all pharma bullshit, and I'm not, I don't believe that this is true, these are bad studies, and uh, we, uh, I'm not doing this. So uh, the questions that the, tra uh, that the trainees ask me, are we as doctors allowed to think and use our knowledge, or are we just people that have to follow guidelines, even if we think that they are uh, that they are wrong. What about this one? He's a nice doctor. Everybody likes him. But he is overweight. The body mass index is of uh, 32. He has, he has got the invitation for his regular checkup as every patient will receive. And he said, oh, no, I'm not going there because I know what will happen and don't, don't like to be scolded by the nurse. So is this uh, unprofessional? Should all doctors be slim and fit? Uh, how does this uh, appearance, is this re appearance relevant to his patients? Because if you are overweight or fat, how does this influence your advice to the patients that you, they should they should lose weight and behave uh, otherwise, because you know what they say. What about you, doctor? Or they say, yes, doctor, of course, doctor, goodbye, doctor, and they talk about this behind your back. So it would be good that the doctors would be slim, but a lot of them are not. I'm, for instance, one of them, but still, not. I'm, my body, body mass index is 27, so it's not that bad, but still. Okay, what about this one? He's a secret smoke. He smokes, he, but he hides his smoking because he knows that the patient shouldn't, shouldn't, um, shouldn't know that because if you are, this, is, this influences very much your advice. But uh, what do you think? Is this... Uh, is this really successful? Because you're, if you're working in a small community, everybody knows not only whether you smoke or not, but about, about all other things in your life, whether you're married or not, how are your children doing at school, 
where have you been on holidays, do you have a lover or not, and so on and so forth. So smoking is a minor thing. This will be discovered very, very fast. <coughs> Have you seen this patient? Who hasn't? I mean, okay, we could we could do this televoting. I, I think we would had 100% of people. Yes, I know this patient. She is a body mass index of 32, uh, and she has been advised to lose weight a million times, and she's always getting very up upset when you mention her body weight. So you decide, no, I'm not going to say this again. So should we? In theory, every single time when the patient comes with, a body, with, with such a body mass index, do this, or should we say, let's forget it, because uh, this will just increase uh, her dissatisfaction and our uh, communication will worsen and I will not be able to treat her effectively. Um, This is a doctor that works as an as independent practitioner. He, off, he devised a, a very elaborated checkup system for his patient, for the patients that are willing to pay. He, pay, he offers this to the uh, uh, companies that are well off, and they pay good money for this prevention program that in, includes uh, ultrasound of abdomen, PSA, pulmonary CT scan, and every now and then some, some other uh, interesting things. Of course, this is not covered by insurance, this is covered by out-of-pocket. This is, is this, uh, uh, and he, uh, is it uh, unprofessional to do that or not? Is his income more important than the benefit for the patients because we know and there are experts here, much more knowledgeable in this field, to know uh, what the, the <coughs> benefits of such an action are. This is uh, a trainee we had at the, at the exam, at the final exam. And he was a brilliant doctor. He knew all the facts. And when we made an analysis of his prescribing, we see, we've seen that he has huge, uh, uh, he's prescribing huge amounts of statins. Because he prescribed statins to all his patients over the age of 50, regardless of the coronary risk. Why? Because before that, he prescribed statins to patients that, whose coronary risk was over 20%, which is in accordance to the uh, guidelines that existed at that point, but one of his patients did not get statins because the doctor said, you, you're not, this is not good for you, I'm not go giving them, uh, them to you, and he d developed a heart attack. So this uh, made such a big influence on his, uh, uh, on his prescribing, the doctor said, well, actually, I'm going to give statins to everybody because uh, I can't live with such a uh, with uh, with such a burden. Um, so how should how much should we allow our fears to influence treatment of our patients? Because our fears always influence treatment of our patients, uh, and they are based on anecdotic evidence and not uh, science. This lady has been a, she's a good doctor. She likes, uh, she's an altruistic person. She's very well loved in the community. And she got invited to give a, a, a presentation about healthy lifestyle for a local community. And she did this for the first time. And then she got an invitation for the second and the third and the fourth and the tenth. And then she said, I'm not doing this. Because they are, she's got not remunerated for that. She's not paid reimbursed in any kind. This, in, this is done out from her own private life, and she said, uh, no, no, I'm not doing it. And because of that, of course, she was regarded by the community 
much worse than the, the, the doctor that said this at the beginning, I'm not doing this because it's not paid for. So what is the limit of our, of our, of our altruism? At a certain point, we, we reach the, the end of it and we say, uh, we can't do it. And the last one. Uh, you know Ernesto. Ernesto Che Guevara was a doctor. And one of his big, big things in the Cuban Revolution was providing free, comprehensive health care for the population. This is why the Cuban Revolution, one of the reasons why the Cuban Revolution was, was also so popular by the population. So should we go that way? Because if, if we are getting involved in, uh, we, we are, as doctors, family doctors, are very much uh, popular by political parties because we are opinion leaders, we work in, in the community, and they would like to uh, like us to be involved in that. Uh, and they would say, well, we are actually advocating the, goal, the same goals you are advocating as a medical professional, so why don't you join us? So to what extent uh, are we allowed to use our position of doctors in politics? Because every now and then we do, and we do that rightly so. Where is the limit? So in the end, as I said, I probably contribute more to confusion than to more knowledge. Uh, but um, these are the gray areas that we face in our lives and in our decisions as medical doctors, as family doctors. Uh, in prevention, we sometimes give false hope and sometimes create unnecessary anxiety. Uh, some, sometimes we create patients out of healthy persons and we raise unnecessary concerns about the future we cannot predict. Uh, we have also, we are people. We have our attitudes and beliefs that sometimes irritate some pay, uh, people and sometimes uh, please others. So we are not perfect. No doctor is perfect. So there is no, no doctor is a, can be a perfect professional. But the trick in professionalism is not that we would have to be perfect. We have to aim to, to be as good as possible. If we want to do that, then we must be aware of the challenges and the dilemmas, which means that we must use common sense and start thinking if we have forgotten how to do that. Thank you very much.